Praise God. If you uh, didn't bring a Bible with you this evening, hold your hand up real high. The ushers have extra Bibles and be glad to let you use one of ours. And let's go to a couple of openings. Uh, we're going to Genesis 8, and then we're going to uh, Proverbs 10, and then we're going to Ecclesiastes 11, and then we're going, and then we're going, and then we're going. <laughs> That's enough for now. But uh, if, you, if you don't find it, we'll put it up on the screen, or they will. Don't we appreciate them putting it up on the screen for us all the time? They do a good job, don't they? Because uh, we give them, like, no warning at all. And uh, they're practicing being instant, in season and out. Um, Genesis 8, we began a series uh, some uh, weeks ago now, not too long back, um, Kim was reading a testimony, already seeing some fruit from it. Thank you, Lord, for people being helped. You know, the, the truth will make you free. And uh, we're calling it How to Harvest. How to Harvest. And our main scriptures are these three that we just mentioned. Genesis 8 and 22, the Lord said this, While the earth remains seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. This is something, uh, the, the cycles that God has created in the earth are going to continue um, as long as this earth remains. And you sometimes people try to put fear in folks and say, well, no, it's, uh, um, you know, there, there won't be any more hot, it'll only be cold, and there won't be any more cold, it'll only be hot, and there'll be, no, no, I believe this right here. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. The cycles are going to continue. And one of the main cycles, just as sure as day and night, is seed time and harvest. Did anybody eat today? Hmm? You know why you ate? Sowing and reaping. Is that right? Whether it was plants or animal or whatever it was that you ate, it's because there was seed involved. And planting and sowing and multiplication and, and harvest. Well, this principle that's all over the earth, all through the earth, is in every area. The Lord said to his disciples when he taught on what we call the parable of the sower, he said, if you don't understand this parable, how will you understand any of the parables? So this is, the, you might say, the granddaddy of them all. Yeah. Sowing and reaping. And... Uh, you know, I, I've heard people mock uh, folks like me. And when we talk about offerings or we talk about giving and we, we refer to something and say, well, I, we sowed that money or we sowed that car or we sowed those clothes. And people mock and go, oh, that's just a, a gimmick that those preachers have worked up, you know, to try to line their pockets. Well, uh, no doubt there's some preachers trying to line their pockets and, and there's also some farmers and, and salespeople and doctors and lawyers and a lot of all kinds of folk trying to line their pockets. And, uh, but that doesn't do away with the, I mean, if 90% if of the preachers were crooks, this would still be true, wouldn't it? This would still be true. Seed time and harvest is the uh, law that governs every area that we contact. Now notice with me in Proverbs 10. Do you believe in sowing and reaping? Let me ask you. In Proverbs, the 10th chapter, and the fourth verse, it says, He becomes poor that deals with a slack hand. But the hand of the diligent makes rich. The New Century Version says a lazy person will end up poor. Is that just as true as Mark 11, 23? Yes, sir. Hmm? Uh -huh. Or Philippians 4, 19? It is. Huh? 
Being lazy will cause you to, to be poor. But a hard worker or diligent will become rich. Diligence is a, a part of enjoying a full measure of, of blessing and good things. Now keep, keep reading in verse 5. It says, he that, uh, well, yeah, that's fine. Those who gather crops on time are wise, but those who sleep through the harvest are a disgrace. Is it possible to sleep through a harvest? Well, if it wasn't, why would, why would it be there? The, the complete Jewish Bible, complete Jewish Bible says it like this, idle hands bring poverty. Diligent hands bring wealth. A sensible person gathers in summer, but he who sleeps during harvest is an embarrassment. The King James says, uh, he that gathers in summer is a wise son. Yeah. Is there any connection between wisdom and harvesting? Yes. Obviously there is. And can you be foolish and fail to harvest? Yeah. It's true. Now, something that we're, we've gotten into, and I'll, I'll review just a little bit and repeat it. Thank God for learning about giving and receiving. And thank God for sowing offerings. But I think the impression has been left in some circles that all there is to, to enjoying full prosperity is giving offerings and making confessions. That if you just give enough offerings and give enough, and if you make enough good confessions, you'll just be blessed beyond your wildest dreams. But there's more to it than that. That's part of it, but it's not all of it. Hmm? And we, we need to look at this. We need, to, we need to see what the other truths are. Beware of taking a truth and trying to make it the truth about everything. The scripture says rightly dividing the word of truth. So according to this, you could sow a bunch of good seed and you could make a, a bunch of good confessions and still sleep right through your harvest. Is that a possibility? Look in Ecclesiastes 11. I know some people are not excited to hear that. <laughs> but all the, all the word is good and all truth will make you free. You know as well as I do if you've been in this any length of time at all, that there's a lot of folks that have given, 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 and confessed and confessed and confessed and, and given and given and given and confessed and confessed and confessed and given and given <laughs> and confessed and confessed and still just as broke as they were 25 years ago. What, did you feel the excitement that ripple through the crowd? You know it's so. So either the word that people have talked about doesn't work, or there's some stuff people don't know. And sometimes people say, well, I'm doing all I know. Well, that may not be enough. You may not know enough. And it's not God's fault that we don't know it. And sadly, there have been whole truths that have been lost to generations because people just turned loose of it and left it and ignored it. And, and so then, then they didn't teach it to their kids and their kids didn't teach it to their kids and, and generations have passed. But the, the word didn't change. Hmm? And uh, it's, it's very, very simple. It is not complicated. People say, well, what? this is new to me. I mean, what, what all do I need to know? It's very, very simple. You won't understand spiritual sowing and reaping? Compare it to natural sowing and reaping. Yes, sir. It's just as easy as that. 
the Lord through Jesus, through Paul, through person after person, talk to us about spiritual sowing and reaping by comparing it to natural sowing of wheat, sowing of this, sowing of that, right? Didn't he? Yep. Well, when it comes to natural sowing and reaping, is reaping automatic? Hmm? No, it's not. Then why would we presume that when it comes to spiritual sowing and reaping, reaping is automatic? And yet, millions do. People think, well, you know, if I give an offering and I make my good confession, that's it, I'm done. The rest of it's up to the Lord. And how much I get back and, and when I get it and, and all that, that's up to Him. That's not true with a wheat crop. That's not true with soybeans. That's not true with corn. It's not true with apples. It's not true with tomatoes. It's not true with okra. It's not true with watermelons. It's not true with plums. It's not true with snap beans, green beans. Huh? Is it? It's not true with jalapeno peppers. It's not true with cantaloupes. <laughs> what am I saying? We know when it comes to every crop like that, every plant, everything that you planted, everything that you sowed, if, if, if somebody doesn't plant the seed, it's not gonna, there's not going to be any crop. But then, even though the seed does what it can do, and the ground what it can do, and God what He makes it do, even if you've got a bumper harvest out there, that harvest is not coming off the stalk or coming off the vine by itself and marching to the barn or the silo. Everybody knows this. And yet, when it comes to spiritual things, people have presumed and assumed, hey, I gave my offering, I said, I'm blessed, I believe I'll receive 30, 60, 100 fold, and that's, that's, that's it, I'm done. Wow. Are you now? Wow. Are you sure that you're done? In uh, Ecclesiastes 11, now you can tell I need to be teaching on this by how quiet it is. <laughs> huh? Because <laughs> if we all were just fully persuaded about it, we'd be shouting and praising God. It'd be great. But, but instead, folks are going, huh. Okay. Wheels are turning and people are looking. and We really should be further along in this than we are. But, you know, uh, not knocking anybody anywhere. I mean, uh, all you can do is walk in the light that you have. And if you don't see it, you don't see it. Oh, but I'm excited. Like this person said that Kim read that report. What they say, they're going to become an expert reaper. That's me too. How many volunteer for that? I, you may have been a good giver. You know. One thing you never want to say, you hear people say it and they think it's humble or something. They say, well, you know, I love to give, I enjoy, but I, it's, I, it's hard for me to receive. Wow. Are you nuts? <laughs> Would we say such a dumb thing? If you never receive, you're not going to have anything to give, right? You better say, I love to give, and I am a top-notch reaper, too. I, you talk about receiving, buddy, look out. I am good at receiving. And if you have difficulty receiving from people, you also have difficulty receiving from God. That's just the way that you are. You know, more than once, I've had the Lord deal with me. It wasn't just something that crossed my mind out of the blue, the Lord dealt with me specifically to sow something into somebody's life or ministry. And there's been more than once that I came to do it, and they said, oh, no, no, I can't receive that. I said, sure you can. <laughs> uh, and, and 
And this one fellow I'm thinking about, now he said, no, no, I, I, I'm sorry, Brother Keith, but I, I can't receive that. I said, sure you can. You open your hand and I'll put it right there and then you close it and, and you'll have it. He said, no, no, I just, uh, uh, that is, it's too, too expensive, it's too costly, I just, I'm not comfortable with it. I, and uh, they said, I, I just can't, I, I can't receive it. And I said, well, Okay. And they didn't know it, but they irritated me. I was glad I was sanctified. I didn't slap them or, or nothing. But do, do you know, in, still in numerous cultures today, rejecting of a gift is like slapping a man, like spitting him in, in the face. It's like saying, uh, you're not good enough and your gift is not good enough. And I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not receiving anything that you have. And, and what they're saying without meaning to, they're saying, you didn't hear from God. Right. You don't know what you're doing. Wow. Yeah. And those of us who take these things seriously, yeah. it's a holy thing. Yeah. It's a precious thing. Yeah. Y'all with me, friends? Yeah. So say it out loud, I'm a good sower. And I'm just as good, just as good at, receiving. at receiving. I'm a good receiver. I'm a good receiver. Thank, you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Uh, that's another message, isn't it? Ecclesiastes 11. Did you find that? Ecclesiastes 11 and 4. It says, He that observes the wind shall not sow. And he that regards the clouds, what? Shall not reap. God's word translation says it like this. Whoever watches the wind will never plant. And whoever looks at the clouds will never harvest. The basic English, the BBE says, he who's looking at the clouds will not get in the grain. Is it possible to get to looking at the wrong thing and put off your giving? Well, I got this coming up and I got that and we don't have this and I just don't have it right now. And so you put it off. And, and, and oh, if you do that, you're playing right into the hand. I'm talking about if the Lord dealt with you to do something and you put it off, then there'll be something next time uh, to cause you to put it off too. Something will come up. The devil will see to it. If it'll knock you out, then hey, he's, he's found out how to control you. Something else will come up. It's amazing what people let, let uh, knock them out of going to church, going to meetings, reading their scriptures, praying, giving. Did you do so and so? No, you know, uh, my toe got to hurting. And, uh, and, you know, and Biffy, my dog, you know, wasn't feeling good. And <laughs> Well... <laughs> If, if something will cause you to not go to church, to not give, to not pray, then you watch it. You, there will be something else and then something else. And you will go weeks and months and years. Because the enemy's perfectly fine. You don't have to say, I'm not going to do it, if you'll just say, not today. He's perfectly happy with that. Because the only place you have ever lived... It's today. And if you never do it today, you never do it. Do you understand that? The enemy knows this very clearly. If he can just get you to put it off till tomorrow, because you will never live in tomorrow. Do you understand what I'm talking about? The only time you have ever lived is today. And if anything ever, ever got done, it's because it was done today, right? Amen. Nothing that ever got done, got done tomorrow. Right. At some point, it's now. Now. We're doing it now. Yeah. Don't be easily distracted and deterred. Easily thrown off. If you get to looking at the wrong thing, you won't plant. If you get to looking at the wrong thing, you won't reap. Is it possible from these scriptures, even though you've planted good seed, and you got a harvest that's come in to fail to harvest it. Yep. Yes. It is. Yes. It is. Now go with me further in the Word 
If you're interested in ground we've already covered, you know, go online and download the previous messages. Or if you're here in the building, go back to the Word Supply and, and get them and get caught up. But otherwise, uh, let's, let's uh, progress tonight in uh, Leviticus. Let's go there first. Leviticus, the 26th chapter. Now, we, we've looked at this, but I want to emphasize another side of this. Are you interested to learn how to harvest? Yes. One of the first things we, we've camped on, we've repeated, is reaping is not automatic. It's not automatic. You know, uh, there's a number of people, word and faith people, that don't like to hear about hundredfold return. It annoys them. It bothers them. And... Uh, Hey, I understand the way some people preach about hundredfold, I don't like that either. Yeah. But, uh, and, and I know folks, uh, people that I count friends, top-notch people, good people, excellent people, but they don't believe uh, in, in the so-called hundredfold return. And uh, I believe this is one of the reasons why is that people look back over their life and they look at other people and, and, and are honest and go, well, you know, I don't see hundredfold off of what I've sown. I don't see fiftyfold off of what I've sown or what they've sown. And, but we must not be led by experience right. or lack of experience or other people's experience or lack of experience. Our faith is supposed to be based in the Word. Yes. And if you ask folks, well, okay, I don't believe in hundredfold, they say. Well, okay, do you believe in fiftyfold? A lot of times folks wouldn't like that either. Well, do you believe in twentyfold? How about twofold? How about point zero zero one fold? And people will get hung up. They'll look at you like, uh, I don't know. Well, do you believe that when you give in faith, and especially at the direction of the Lord, that there will be a multiplication of what you gave and it'll come back to you? They go, oh yeah, I, I just believe you'll be blessed. <coughs> well, that's pretty vague. What do you mean? What do they mean by that? They mean they believe it's all up to the Lord. Hmm? Whether they reap, when they reap, how much they reap, they believe that's up to the Lord. And some of these same people, they don't believe that their healing is just all up to the Lord. They don't believe that being filled with the Spirit is just all up to the Lord. They don't believe that being born again is just all up to the Lord. So why do they believe this? Is all up to the Lord. And like we said, no crop comes into the barn by itself. We know that. No, this has been a gap. This has been a hole. So don't, don't be down on folks if they don't say they believe in this or that. A lot of times they're being honest. They don't see it. And you know, if they don't see it, they ought not try to jump on somebody else's bandwagon and try to act like that they do. No. But I believe this is a big answer. Reaping is not automatic. We must sow in faith. We must wait in faith. And we must reap in faith. Can you say amen? amen. Now in Leviticus 26, are you believing with me this evening? Yes. I would appreciate it. Leviticus 26. Because it's going to get even more exciting. <laughs> Not saying it won't be quiet. But quiet can be exciting too. Leviticus 26.3. He said, if you walk in my statutes and you keep my commandments and do them, I'll give you rain in due season. And the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Somebody say harvest. 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 Thank you, Lord. 
And verse 5, your threshing shall reach unto your vintage, your vintage shall reach unto the sowing time, you'll eat your bread to the full, and you'll dwell in your land safely. Thank you, Lord. Skip down to verse 10. You'll eat old store and bring forth the old because of the new. Now this is being blessed. This is prosperity. This is being rich. You don't have to be a billionaire or a trillionaire to be rich. You could actually have a billion dollars and still be a poor man or woman on the inside. Because there's more to being rich than a dollar amount. But if you say, well, yeah, I'm rich in God, rich in God, but you can't pay your bills. Well, honey, you ain't rich enough. Because rich in God affects every area of life. And don't, don't, don't think, don't believe uh, deception that, well, maybe God's teaching me something through this poverty. No, no, poverty is a curse. Now, uh, this is being rich. From, the, from the, the scripture perspective. What's, what uh, Paul said, the Spirit of God threw him to the Corinthians. We, we quote it every time we have an offering. Always having all sufficiency in all things and being able to abound to every good work. It's, it's being rich. It's having plenty. Can you see? Uh, they are already reaping before they run out of their previous reaping. Can you see that? And one of the definitions in the scriptures for prosperity is to reach. The opposite of reaching is running out before you get there. But if you're, if you're prospering in the Lord, you, you don't run out of money before you get paid again. If, you can, if you've been running out all the time before you get paid again, something is wrong. That's not supposed to be the norm for your life. That is not the blessed life. You're supposed to get paid and you still got money left over from the last you got paid. Hmm? And you're getting new stuff and your old stuff is not wore out. It's top notch stuff. And you have to pull out your 2007 car to put your new 2012 car in. Nothing wrong with it. It's a good car. Got 8,000 miles on it. But you, you got to make room. You don't want your 2013 sitting out in the weather. So what do you do? You just wind up with 50 cars? No, nah, you sow those cars. You, you, you give on a level that you never have before. Hmm? Y'all with me, friends? Yes. Now, notice he said that you th this would happen with you. But skip on down to verse uh, 15. If you don't obey him, if you despise his statutes, if your soul abhors my judgments, so that you will not do all my commandments, but you break my commandments, you know the, one of the main things that will absolutely ruin your life? Stubbornness, rebellion, hard-headedness. I'm telling you, it, it can ruin your life. He said, if you won't do it, if you won't listen to me, verse 16, this will happen. I'll appoint over you terror, consumption, burning ague. Now, you wouldn't even have to know what that is to know you don't want it, right? <laughs> consumption of the eyes, sorrow of the heart. Now, notice this curse. You'll sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. That's a curse, isn't it? Isn't that a curse? Skip down to verse 20. Your strength shall be spent in vain. Your land shall not yield her increase. Neither shall the trees of, your, of the land yield their fruits. Now, if you read the whole thing, did they plant crops? They did, but they didn't get it. They planted it, and it brought forth a heart. Some of it wouldn't even produce. Some of it that did produce, somebody else came and got it. 
So here's examples of planning, but not reaping. Reaping is not automatic. It takes the blessing of the Lord to sow and reap. And it takes obedience of us to sow and reap. Can you say amen? amen. Now, let's see. Go with me over to uh, Deuteronomy 11. Let's look at the blessing. Don't think this doesn't apply to you now. Because it does. If you don't understand it all, don't, don't throw it away. Some things will minister to your heart that don't even register on your head. His word is a living word. It's life to those that find it. It's health to all their flesh. Deuteronomy 11 and, and 13. He said, it shall come to pass if you'll hearken diligently to, to my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain. Now, the first rain is right after you planted to get this thing going. And the last rain is later on to help finish up the harvest. You got the rain to get it going and the rain to finish her up. that you may gather in your corn and your wine and your oil. This is the blessing. Skip on down to verse, uh, well, well, let's see, verse 15. I'll send grass in your fields for your cattle and you, you may, that you may eat and be full. What's the will of God for me? For you. Eat and be full. Plenty. Extra. Right? I mean, I hadn't spent what I got, and I've already got more coming in. Hmm? I'm having to bring forth the old, the still top-notch stuff to make room for the new. Hmm? Have you ever heard that phrase before, not enough room? Hmm? That is God's will for our life, is that we've got, we've got increase We've got blessing, we've got abundance until we, we are running out of room for it. Of course, that's not a problem, is it? Because what can we do? We can give. We can sow yet more and more. But in order to be able to sow like that, you've got to reap like that. There will be no sowing like that unless there's reaping like that. You sow, you know, you start off where you are, small, but then if you're going to uh, sow on that level, you'll have to reap. And then sow and then reap and then sow. And now, man, it's, it's coming in. You've been getting it out on every wave. And now it's coming back on every wave. And man, I mean, the blessing of the Lord is overtaking you. And you're thinking, man, I, this, I just got this. What am I going to do with this? I'm going to have to move this around. But how many think that sounds like fun? Does that sound like fun. Is God that good? Yes. Is that really his will? Yes. If, it, if that's his will, then raking and scraping is not his will. A bleak, bare, scarce existence is not his will. Now all of us in here have experienced less than his perfect will at times. But don't let that hold you back. Let's just rise up and go on. Yeah. Amen. Put those chapters behind us and say, Lord, I want the full thing. I want, and I'm willing to do what I, my part, what I need to do. Now, uh, go with me if you would. Well, I'm, I'm trying to move too fast. Let me, let me take just a little bit longer. V verse 16, the next verse right here in this 11th chapter. Deuteronomy eleven sixteen, he said, take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. 
Now let's just stop right here. People read that and they think, well, you know, that's Old Testament. That don't apply to us. The Bible said covetousness is idolatry in the New Testament. So, oh, yeah, there's plenty of idolatry going on. Yet, sadly, we got a lot of false gods in this country. False temples and fa- idols and people praying to things other than God. Hey, it's a reproach on our land. Because I guarantee you, the Lord's not any happier about it now than he was then. And it's also some of the reason why we've had some of the troubles we've had. But verse 17, he said, if you do that, the Lord's wrath will be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, and there be no rain, and, and that the land yield not her fruit, and you perish quickly from off the good land that the Lord gives you. That's no harvest, is it? That's a failure to reap. Go over to the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy. We looked at this last time, but let's look at it again. He referred to the blessing of the Lord. In Deuteronomy 28, he said, If you'll keep my commandments and do what I tell you to do, you'll be blessed when you go out. You'll be blessed when you come in. You'll be blessed in your basket. You'll be blessed in your store. Amen. Everything you put your hand to, prosper. Hmm? Is that the will of God? Yes. Well, let me ask you like this. Is obeying him the will of God? Yes. Well, then when you obey him, he said, that's what will happen. So now, now he goes on to say, if you won't listen to him, what about verse 15 or so on now? If you don't listen to him, don't keep his commands, all these curses will come on you. You'll be cursed when you go out. You'll be cursed when you come in. You'll be cur- Everywhere you were blessed, now you'll be cursed. And he mentions scarcity and lack. And, and he mentions the same idea in verse 23 of Deuteronomy 28, 23. The heaven over your head will be brass and the earth that's under you will be iron. You can't have harvests like that. Right. Now we say this and we'll come back to it. We, we said sowing seed, giving offerings and making confessions is not all there is to reaping big harvests and being blessed. There's more to it. And if you have gotten good ground and you got good seed and you had the good sense to sow your good seed in the good ground, you are off to a wonderful start. But you're not there. I said, you're not there. You need some other things to happen to get all the way through this. And two of the most significant things you need is you need rain and you need protection. If you're going to experience a full crop and a full harvest, you're going to see this thing all the way through. You've got to have the right amount of rain at the right times and you got to, you got to protect your crop from things like Beetles, weevils, worms, birds, hmm? aphids, hmm? bugs, pests. Because there are a bunch of different things that can absolutely decimate a crop. Have I got any gardeners in here at all? Let me see. Any gardeners? Any farmers, am I telling the truth in here? That you can have some of the prettiest stuff and it's green and you didn't pick it and you're looking forward to it and you come back and there's a big old brown spot on it and there's a worm in there or there's something that's bit through the branch and chewed up the leaves and this is a curse. And this can consume your harvest. There have been numerous times. Now, you know, there's there's been a lot of development in recent times in pesticides and and these kind of things, but still there are big issues. But prior to that especially, man, there have been the most beautiful crops that have been totally lost because of pests. 
something consumed them. Something ate them up. Let, let me go through this again. How do we understand spiritual sowing and reaping? Very easy. Compare it to natural sowing and reaping. That's what the Lord taught us to do. That's what the Spirit of God through Paul taught us to do. Have you read these passages in the Scripture? They're numerous places. Simple. If it don't line up with natural sowing and reaping, it's not right. Because the one came from the other. The natural came from the Spirit. And you, if you got good seed and you planted it in good ground, you're off to a good start. But are you there? You're not there. You got to make it through the growing season, don't you? And we're not talking about just a day or two. We're talking about weeks. We're talking about months, depending on what it is. Some things like trees, you're talking about years. Hmm? And you got to have the right conditions. You can pretty much count on the sun shining. The rain is a big, big factor. And you've got to have protection. Now, where are, where are, you, are you holding the place or not? Hmm? How about going to Haggai, the first chapter? Talking about how to harvest. We don't want to just plant a bunch of seed and never hear from it again. Hmm? <laughs> Not everybody's excited about these truths. <laughs> Brother Keith, I was just happier when I believed it was all up to God. <laughs> Are you sure? Huh? You rather do you rather be ignorant and not reap hmm? or find out what's been going on huh? and get it fixed and start reaping like you never have before. Anybody interested in this now besides me? I, I don't pastor a goof off church. We are a sowing bunch. Yes. Come on. Yes. People that don't go here know we are. Yes. We are a giving, sowing bunch. Yes. But our reaping has got to come up yes. with our sowing. Yes. And it's my job to preach and teach about it. Yes. So that faith comes. Yes. So that our faith to, to reap comes up yes. another level. Because, it, again, it is essential and integral to the plan of God. In order to do everything he's called you to do individually and us to do as a church and a ministry, we've got to reap. Yes. We better believe in 30, 60, 100 fold because it's going to take it. And the Lord, he's not keeping it from us. He's not holding it back from us. But he's not going to change his cycles that he's put into the earth. Because we wouldn't listen and do it his way. Even, even if you go for decades, he's not going to go, you know, they're just not getting it. I'm going to have to change this thing up. <laughs> they just are not doing what I told them to do. They just, I'm going to have to completely change the rules and make it work some way that will work for them. Not going to happen. I said not going to happen. That would just mean that we missed out. But no, we don't have to. We don't have to. His word is a light to our path. The entrance of his word gives us light. Thank you, Lord. In Haggai, the first chapter and the first verse. Haggai 1 and 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, verse 2, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say. Now who's talking? Does anybody know who's talking? The Lord's talking. He said that this people are saying, 
Does the Lord hear what we say? He said, I've been hearing something. I'm hearing my people say that the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Are they saying, we're not going to do it? No. What are they saying? Not now. It's not time. Now. To build the Lord's house. The, the Lord's house, his temple had been destroyed, had been torn down, and, and it needed everything. They needed uh, uh, stone. They needed uh, uh, carpentry work. They needed uh, everything. And they said, it's not time to do it. Verse 3. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet and said, verse 4, Is it time for you, O you, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? They said, It's not time to build the Lord's house. He said, Is it time for you to, to fix your house up? It's not time for my house, but it's time for your house. Verse 5, now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Keep reading. You have sown much, and what? Bring in little. You have sown much, and bring in little. You eat, but have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there's none warm. And he that earns wages, earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. You get paid and you go, where did that money go? Man, that money just went so fast. I mean, I just got paid and... It's Monday afternoon and I'm out and I don't get paid again for two weeks or till the end of the month. Or, and I have sown and sown and sown. And I'm just getting a little bit here and there. Is this the Bible? Should we believe the Bible? Yes. Verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. We should not just go through life banging our head against the wall, doing the same thing and getting the same results. If things are not going the way we know the Lord wants them to go for us, we need to consider our ways. What are we doing? What have we been doing? There needs to be a change. Verse 8, he said, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. What house is he talking about? He's talking about his house. Build my house. And I will take pleasure in it. And I will be glorified, says the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. Keep going. You looked for much. And lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I didn't blow upon it. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that is waste. And you run every man to his own house. Verse 10. Therefore the heaven over you is what? Stayed from dew and the earth is stayed from her fruit. No rain, no fruit. No rain, no produce. Can you see this? And why is this going on? Not that people didn't love the Lord. Not that they don't have great aspirations of doing great things for him one day, sometime, maybe soon. But right now we got, we got school and we got tuition and we got insurance payments and, and we got this and we got to fix the transmission and taxes and And as soon as we get caught up, we're going to do this, we're going to do... No, no, you're not. Because you're violating the first law of prosperity. And that is to put him first, right. not you. Right. 
Now you know how I know this so so well. Because <laughs> Phyllis and I missed it in this area. Even after we answered the call to be in the ministry, and even after we had I'd gone to, to Bible school, and, and even after we were in the ministry for uh, I don't know two or three, four or five years, yeah, more like four or five, I guess. Um, we were broke. I believed in prosperity. I believed in sowing and reaping. I believed much as I knew. But man, we're just, we're tight, 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 and then got behind. And when you were barely making it to start with, and then you get behind, and you got to maintain and try to catch up, and you were barely maintaining when you're just half a nostril above water, it don't take much to drown. Hmm? And, and we went through this for years. And finally one day I came in after work and nobody was at the house but me yet. And I fell across the bed and, and cried. I wept. I said, Lord, this is not right. I mean, we didn't have enough money to, for gas to go to a meeting we wanted to go to. And we wanted so, so badly to sow into some kingdom things that were going on. And, and we couldn't pay our bills. And we're behind on, on our bills. We're behind on our house payment. We're behind on our taxes. We're behind on this, behind on that. Preacher. Preaching prosperity. I said, Lord, this is not right. This is not right. I know this is not your fault. But I know from you, I know enough about your word to know this is not your will that we should be living like this. I don't believe we have to live like this. Have mercy on me. Help me. What I don't see, show me. Whoever you can connect me with or, or, or bring the word into my life or, or the anointing, I'm asking for your help. And I was as sincere as I knew how to be and I cried before him and prayed. And the Bible said, if you seek for him with all your heart, you'll find him. Amen. And I want you to know he, he was faithful. He heard that prayer. And I, did, I didn't see all the answers that day or by the end of the week. But looking back now, something changed. And it seemed like for the next five years, the Lord was talking to me every day about this subject. Showing me things and teaching me and helping me. And I don't claim to have even remotely half arrived, but we're in a lot better shape now than we were then. Thank you, Lord. And the bills are paid. Amen. And we're not behind. And we're giving and sowing. And I believe we'll come up from where we are. But the first thing he dealt with me about and he showed me. He took me to Matthew 6.33. Hold your place there and turn over. Hold your place in Haggai. And go to Matthew 6.33. I knew this verse. Well, I, let me say it like this. I knew about it. <laughs> I'd heard it many times. Preached it a number of times. He took me to that verse. I was prompted. I don't mean I'm hearing an audible voice now, but the communication of the Lord can be very, very real to you Amen. if you'll learn how to yield to Him. That's right. This is for not just for preachers or, uh, or people that spend extra time praying. This is for anybody. Yes. Anybody. Right. Any child of God that'll listen. He took me to that verse. He said, this, this is the first thing that you need to get a hold of, you and Phyllis. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I said, I believe that, Lord. I know that. I believe that, Lord. He said, no, you're not doing it. Mm. I had asked him for this. Are y'all with me now? I said, Lord, show whatever it is I need to see. He said, he said you and Phyllis are not doing this. He said, in fact, many of my people know this verse, but are not doing it. They know it, but they're not doing it. And he began to explain to me just what I just mentioned to you. He said, they, they work. 
they get paid, and the first thing they think about is, uh, you know, we got to pay this, we got the rent, we got the mortgage, we got the car payment, we got the, the insurance, the kids need this, we got to have this. And of course, you know, you got to put your kids first. There's only one first position. <laughs> well, I got to put my family first. If you do, you're not putting God first. There's only one number one spot. Right? He said people, you know, they, and so they'll, they'll do all these things and then they'll come to church and not even have thought about what they might give in the offering till it's offering time. And then they'll look in their pocketbook or their purse to see if they've got any, any, any loose money or something that they can spare. And they've put insurance, school, clothes, car, pets, hobbies, everything before the Lord's house. So they don't qualify. They don't qualify for him to add these things to them. Are y'all with me so far? Hmm? I didn't write this verse now, did I? I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about what he told me. He said, you are not practicing this. You're not doing this. And the very first thing he talked to me about was tithing. So I'm going to talk to you about tithing. Not later. Right now. <laughs> Go back to Haggai. What is, if you, you might say it like this, the master principle of God's prosperity? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. He had mentioned what you eat, what you wear. Uh, we're talking about you know, housing and all these things. All these things will be added to you. If you do what? You put him first. Now in Haggai, uh, now you know, don't get concerned if, if you're visiting with us. I'm not going to take up an offering at the end of the service. <laughs> the offering's already been received. No more offerings tonight, as far as I know. Nobody's going to ask you for anything. And this is not about what you, you're not going to be asked to make any commitments or any pledges. No, no, no. This is not about you doing anything for us or for this church. This is about something between you and God. Yes. That's right. Between you and God. And I assure you, you do want to know it. Because yes. if you haven't seen it and you're not doing it yet, it has the ability to totally change your life. I can look back now and see where Phyllis and I are so broke and struggling so much and we're in such a different place today and I can look back and see that's where our, our breakthrough began. That's where we begin to come up and come out. I can see it. I know it's so. Haggai 1, we saw, he said, they're saying it's not time to build the Lord's house. He said, is it time for you to dwell in your sealed houses to do your, your things? In, in the second chapter, and the sixth verse, Haggai 2, of course, just two chapters there. Haggai 2 and 6. He said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once it's a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Verse 7. I'll shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Look at the very next verse. The silver is mine. What's that got to do with glory? And the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. What's that got to do with it? He's talking about fixing up his house. And it takes silver and gold. <laughs> Some folks don't know if they like this or not. 
You do understand I didn't write this. Right? This was here a long time before I ever got here. Verse 9. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, said the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, said the Lord of hosts. The Lord's house was not built out. It was not developed. The thing had not happened. And the Lord's telling them ahead of time, it is going to happen. And it's going to be bigger and better than it ever was before. And I'm going to bring everything it needs to, that you need to get it done. But look where the breakthrough came. Same thing I was talking about a few minutes ago. Verse 16 of that second chapter. Verse 16. He had told them, consider your ways. You sowed a lot and you just reaped and got in just a little bit. And you worked hard, but it seemed like you put your, your money in a bag that had holes in it. It just went away. Where did it go? You're just coming up short right and left. And since those days, when one came to a heap of 20, there was just 10. You should have got 20 out of it, and you only got half what you should have got. And when you came to the press fat to draw out 50 vessels, there were just 20. I mean, you're just getting a fraction of what you ought to be getting. Now, this is not the kind of reaping we're going to do here at Faith Life Church. We don't believe in minus 50% fold. <laughs> we believe in a positive 30, 60, 100 fold. But can you see this happens? This kind of thing happens in the earth. It answers some questions, doesn't it? These are people who sowed, but they are not reaping. I mean, they're, they're coming up half what they ought to be coming up with. Do we know why? Why? Because they were putting their stuff first. And they weren't taking care of the Lord's house. Verse uh, 17. Smote you with blasting and mildew and hail and all the labors of your hand. Yet you turn not to me, said the Lord. No matter how bad it got... They just kept on doing the same dumb stuff. When it gets bad, it's time to get right. Come on, y'all, listen. You, you don't just keep going and things are going down, down, down and worse and worse. You don't just keep giving offerings and making confessions. That's not all there is to it. You've already sown. You've made confessions. You should be reaping. Why not? There are reasons why. You can sleep right through a harvest. You can get to looking at the wrong thing and not get a harvest. You can plant good seed in good ground. But you've got to have rain. And you've got to be protected from pests. Can you see these things, friends? He said, you, you, weren't, you weren't reaping. You were losing. They're not blessed, they're cursed. Verse 18. Consider now though, the Lord's so good, he's so kind. From this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month. <laughs> he quotes from the day, date, the month and, and the day. From the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. They hadn't got it built yet. They just started on it. Amen, that's right. They started on what? Of what? His house. Somebody say his house. Yes. They quit putting it off. They quit procrastinating and delaying. They quit putting their stuff ahead of his. They said, we're going to do it. And they started on it. And they just are moving some dirt and just some doing some foundation work. And the Lord said, yes. you know. This day that you started moving dirt on my place. Come on, verse 19. Is the seed yet in the barn? You haven't even planted it yet. And the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree, it's not time for them to bring forth, but I want you to know from this day will I bless you. I'm going to bless you. 
No more of this sowing a bunch and reaping a little. No more of this coming and only getting half or a third of what you were supposed to get. From this day, from the day you started putting my stuff first, I'm going to bless you. And how many believe when the Lord says, I'm going to bless you? Look out. We're going to have to move out the old to get in the new. It's going to overtake us before, you know, we, we had not run out of the first one yet. And the next is already overtaken. From this day. From what day? From what day? From the day. They began to put his things first instead of theirs. Now go to Malachi 3. We're talking about how to harvest. Does tithing have anything to do with harvesting? Yes, it does. In uh, Malachi, the third chapter, and the eighth verse, I'm going to read this in the NIV. I'm going to read it to you in a couple of different translations. I hope you got a few extra minutes. I'm not done. Hmm? This is important. This is life-changing stuff. I already shared with you about me and Phyllis, and I, I didn't you know, go into great detail about it, but I'm telling you, it changed our life. He said, will a man rob God? Is it possible to rob God? This is the Bible we're reading. Yet he said, you rob me. And they said, how do we rob you? He said, in tithes and offerings. Verse 9, you're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you're robbing me. Now when you sow a lot and you only get just a little and you begin to get a crop coming up, and the storm destroys it, and the pests consume it, that's not blessed, is it? That's sowing and not reaping. Cursed. Verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in, in, in what? My house. That there might be full provision in his house, his things. Test me in this. I don't know if anywhere else in the Bible that says this. Where God says, test me, check me out. On almost any other kind of situation, it could be interpreted as tempting God. But here God himself says, prove this out. Test me. With what? You bring all the tithe into my house and watch what I do. Prove me. Check me out. We're talking about the Almighty that sits on the throne. Says, check me out. Test me. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Now you can say what you want and scriptorians and theologians can say what they want, but I believe that word for word. I believe it literally, absolutely. Yes, I do. I believe it absolutely. I believe God is that good. I believe he's that great. Tithing, my brother, sister, is not taking something away from you. People think, and I know because Phyllis and I were there. They think, I can't afford to tithe. Oh, I know it well. Because when the Lord said to me, you know this, but you're not doing it, that was a big part of the problem. We tithed kind of, (laughs) sort (laughs) of. I mean, I've been to Bible school. We're in the ministry. But you know, you can't pay your bills. You're behind on taxes and everything else. 
There ain't no extra money to do anything with. And it can seem like this is one area we can put off. Because <laughs> there's nobody from the church dunning you for it. <laughs> Calling you and bugging you, making you got to pay your tithe. That's one collector you don't have, so... <laughs> We can, we can put them off. Now here's the big question. <laughs> Does the tithe, now tithe just simply means the tenth. T-E-N-T-H, the tenth. Or we'd probably say 10%. The tenth part. Does the tenth belong to the Lord? Yes. This is something that people debate and fuss about and holler about and kick and oh man I, I started to say small wars but they're not small there's <laughs> medium sized and big wars have been fought over this subject right. and there, is, there are a big portion of the church huge portion of the church does not tithe right. just a fact and uh I believe we have a lot of tithers in our church, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not so foolish as to think everybody tithes. But I do have enough faith to believe that everybody could, yes. <laughs> and not give up. Yes. Not for what we could get. No. I want to see every person in this place protected yes. and blessed. Yes. Hallelujah. I want to see everybody that ever sowed a seed into this church or any other church or any other mission or ministry or, or man or woman of God or brother or sister. I want to see you reap. I want to see you reap a full harvest off of all you sowing and come into the best place of your life, into a better place than you've ever been before. And I know that won't happen if you don't tithe. I know some people don't like to hear that, but it's just a fact. Yes, because harvesting is dependent on more than just sowing seed right. and making confessions. Yes. You got to get all the way through the growing season. Come on now, are y'all listening to me? Yes, and you got to have the rain. Yes. Yes. What did we just get through reading about? When you bring all the tithe into the storehouse, what's going to happen? What's the first thing he talked about? The windows of heaven... See, this has to do with rain. You study all the other scriptures. This has to do with the rain coming. And rain is synonymous with blessing. And it is the blessing that brings the increase. And the blessing of the Lord makes rich. And he adds no sorrow with it. But that's the first part of it. That's not all of it. Are there benefits for tithers? What's the first one? You get rain. You, you, your sowing is blessed. Tithing isn't sowing. But tithing's connected to sowing. If you want your sowing blessed, if you want your sowing protected, you must tithe. Elsewise, it's possible to sow, 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 and confess, 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 and lose a harvest. I know people don't like to hear this. Is it possible in the natural? Have crops ever been lost for lack of rain or for something that consumed the crop? Well, that's what the Bible has given us to teach us about spiritual sowing and reaping. So we've got to know it's the same. Keep reading. If you bring all the tithe, he said, test me, prove me. I'm going to open up the windows of heaven. I'm going to pour out blessing on you. You're going to have increase to the point you won't have room to receive it. And what else is going to happen? What else is going to happen? I will prevent pests. Would you like to be pest free? I will prevent pests from devouring your crops 
and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. You won't lose crops. Verse 12, then all the nations will call you blessed. Yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Oh, somebody say, thank you, Lord. Say it again. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know who's the happiest about this right now? Tithers. <laughs> Which is also why not everybody is excited. Because <laughs> there's a lot of folks that's not tithers. And uh, still not sure if they want to be or not. When you, uh, well, let me do it like this. Go, go back, hold, hold your place in Malachi, I'm not through. I'm endeavoring not to waste any time, but some of this is just taking a little time. Do you have it or not? Yeah. Don't, don't, don't get too antsy now. You, you, ought, you ought to make up your mind once and for all about this, shouldn't you? Yeah. Get, get this settled. And don't let it be about the money. What do you really see in the Word? What do you really know? Don't make a decision based on what you have or what you don't have. Is God big enough to bless you? Yes. Huh? Yes. Is he big enough to do this thing that he's talking about here? Yes. He is. Uh, Leviticus 27, verse 30. This is just one of numerous places that talk about this. Leviticus 27, 30. All the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the churches. No. The pastors. No. Whose? The Lord's. The Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Somebody say holy. Holy unto the Lord. Did the scripture say that the tithe is his? It belongs to him. This is not the only place it says this. But it says it very clearly. The tithe is the Lord's. Say it out loud. The tithe, the tithe is, is the Lord's. Lord. Say it again. The tithe, the tithe is, is the Lord's. Lord. Now in Luke, you don't have to turn there. They'll put it up on the screen for us. But in uh, Luke 20, you, you do realize this is a, a three-week series I'm trying to compress into a, the rest of the service here. You believing with me or not? Yes. In Luke, let's see, 25, I believe is where I want you to go, and then we'll back up to, uh, to 20. Sorry. Hold Luke 20. Go to Matthew 23. I'm trying to avoid taking another two hours. Matthew 23 and 23. 23, 23. Red letters. Who's talking? Anybody know who's talking? You hear people say, well, yeah, but now that was Old Testament, Brother Keith. Tithing is under the Old Testament. Actually, tithing was before the, the covenant that God gave Israel. And it was also during, and it is also after. Abraham tithed, didn't he? This is long before the law. He's a tither. His kids are tithers. Hmm? And of course, tithing was all during the law. And now here we are with Jesus in the New Testament. He says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. Now, they're tithing their spices. Yeah. 
That's like tithing your salt and your pepper. They're very meticulous about tithing the least little thing. And a lot of people say, oh, that's ridiculous. You know, we're in, we're in the new covenant. Jesus wouldn't care about that. And he went on to say, uh, and you've omitted the weightier matters of law, judgment, and mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done. Mm-hmm. Is he saying they should have tithed? And not to leave the other undone. Listen to the New Living Translation. The New Living says it like this. You should tithe, yes. But do not neglect the more important things. Who said you should tithe? The head of the church? This has been the perfect place to change it and say, no, that's under the old covenant and we're changing some things now. And so you don't have to think about that anymore. He said, no, you should tithe. Just don't forget these other important things. Don't get hung up on that. Luke 20 and 25, they put that up on the screen for us. Luke 20 and 25 in the, uh, also in the New Living. He said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. If the tithe belongs to him, We should give it to him. Shouldn't we? And if it's his, we're not not giving it to him. It's not an offering. We're not sowing. It's already his. We're returning what he said was his. But see, millions would say, hey, my money is my money. I worked for it. I earned it. Nobody gave it to me. It's all mine. And what they're saying, whether they mean to or not, is they're saying, I did all of this on my own. I created this increase. I don't owe anybody any acknowledgement. And that's simply not true. I said, that's not true. You wouldn't have had another heartbeat. You couldn't have put two thoughts together. You couldn't have got out of bed in the morning. Come on, do you know this? Unless the Lord had allowed you, helped you, given you another day, given you the ability to think, given you favor to make a deal. Come on, given you the strength to finish a project. And if you got any smarts, when it all works out, in spite of your mistakes, and you make some money, and it goes good, it's time to take the tithe right off the top. Come on, are you listening to me? And come before the Lord and hold it up and say, Lord, I acknowledge that I am nothing. I would have nothing except for you. I'm giving thanks. You are my strength, and and this came from you, and there's a lot more where this came from, and so I gladly return the tithe, and I'm going to add some offering to it too. Hmm? And he said, if you'll bring your tithes and offerings, come on, tell me, what did he say? Go back to Malachi. What did he say in Malachi? What's going to happen? Let me read this in the New Living Bible. Verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I'll pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. I don't know of another verse like that in the Bible. Your crops will be abundant. For, are you you listening to this? For why? Why? I will guard them from insects and disease. Do you need this to get all the way from sowing to reaping? You got to have some blessing. That's the rain. And you got to have some protection. What will get that for you? Tithing. Tithing. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they're ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Oh, somebody say, thank you, Lord. 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 Lord. (sighs) 
The complete Jewish Bible is, is interesting on this one too. Let me read it to you. The complete Jewish Bible, verse 10 says, Bring the, the, t the whole tenth into the storehouse so that there will be food in my house. What if everybody tithed? Man, the church, would the church have any, any needs? Or, no. That there may be meat in my house, that there may be the supply. He said, and put me to the test, says Adonai. See if I won't open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out for you a blessing far beyond your needs. Amen. For your sakes, I will forbid the devourer to destroy the yield from your soil. Come on, or you have a picture of the Almighty and the devourers trying to consume your stuff that you've worked hard and your deals that you tried to make and your crops and your whatever you're working on and the devourer is all prepped and got all prepared to mess up your life and, and, and the Lord says, no you don't, no you don't. No you don't. You don't touch their stuff. Why? Tell me why. Because you're a tither. I will forbid the devourer to destroy the yield from your soil and your vine will not lose its fruit before harvest time, says Adonai. Verse 12, and all nations will call you happy for you will be a land of delights. Somebody say glory to God. Listen to the easy to read translation. It says, good things will come to you like rain falling from the sky. How many like that? Good things. Listen to this. The message Bible says in verse 12, you will be voted happiest nation. <laughs> You'll experience what it's like to be a country of grace. Complete English says, every, every one of every nation will talk about how I have blessed you and about your wonderful land. I, the Lord, all powerful, have spoken. Do we need his blessing yes. on our sowing, yes. natural and spiritual? Yes. Do we need his protection yes. so that something doesn't consume our crop, yes. mess up our deals? Hmm? before we can get it in. And tithing is what he has given us that allows him into our life so he can do this for us. And I know where people are at because Phyllis and I made the same mistakes. And, and you don't set out to do it this way, but he told me, he said, you're not doing that verse. You're not doing what I told you to do. And you're so tight and everything's behind and there's the pressure and... And, you know, as far as anybody else, no, who knows whether you're tithing or not. And you, you don't, you, you don't, you're not saying you're not going to tithe. You just can't do it right now. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? And this was why he said people were sowing and not reaping much and losing and stuff being consumed. And what, with, even if you believe the tithe is the Lord's, you're saying, Lord, uh, I'm going to use your tithe to pay my electric bill. And I hope you don't mind. And uh, later on, I'm going to believe you for enough to pay you back and tithe. No. Really? No. Do you see what's going on here? So now how is your confidence going to be to believe him for the money to pay him back and to, it ain't going to be there. That's right. I know because I was there. Phyllis and I talked, I told her what the Lord said to me. We got in the floor, we prayed, we talked about it. I said, we're through, we're through messing around with this. This is not an option. The tithe, I mean, understand, if you got some of my money, it ain't your money. That's right. You can't spend it and buy something for you. It's not your money. If I got some of your money, it's not mine. 
It doesn't make any difference what I need. It's not my money. And if the tithe is the Lord's, it's not your money. Come on, do you believe it or not? It's not your money. So there should be no debate about what I do with this, with this 10%. It ain't mine. So I can't pay my bills. I can't buy stuff I want. I can't go fishing. I own it. I, I can't do it. It's his. Right. That's right. So we are going to, whenever something comes in, we're going to take that first 10% right off the top before we pay a bill, before we even look at anything else, and we're going to separate it. That's, that's part of the definition of the holy portion. It's separated. It's special. We're going to separate it from our stuff, and that's his money. That goes to his church. That goes to his works. That goes to his ministries. That's, it's his. And so we begin to do that. And we were in just as big a mess as we'd ever been in. But we began to do it. We didn't try to do it. We didn't plan to do it. We did it. Come on, are you listening to me? And oh, we found out that when you do that, even though at the moment you got less money to pay bills with than you did when you was keeping the tithe, a confidence will come up in your spirit. Come on, are you listening to me? A confidence that the Lord, you didn't have enough to do it anyway. You're going to have to believe God anyway. And it's so much easier to believe him when you have obeyed him, when you have put him first. You got confidence to stand and say, yes, it'll come. We'll have more than we need. And I'm telling you, in, uh, in just a few months, we, we had people come and, and, and sow money and, and we caught up our bills and we caught up our house stuff and we caught up this, we caught up that. Had one guy, we owed 10000 something dollars on our taxes. And, and of course, that was accruing penalty, you know, and we just didn't have it. And in the next few months, the Lord dealt with the person. He caught me off after service. He said, uh, do you owe money on your taxes? I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, how much? I said, do you need to know? <laughs> he said, I owe money on my taxes too. And I need to sow. And the Lord told me to sow. And I said, yes, sir. He said, how much? And I told him, I said, well, it's over $10,000. He said, okay, I'm going to send you a thousand a month till that's paid. Wow. I didn't ask him about it. He didn't, even, he didn't even know it. Certainly didn't say anything to him about it. And he did it too. I mean, every month here it came and it was paid in full. Do you know the Lord will help you even if you messed yourself up, even if you did dumb stuff? I'm telling you though, that happened after after we made the commitment that we weren't trying, we weren't playing with this anymore, the tithe belongs to the Lord. And we're going to take it and we're going to present it to Him and we're going to worship Him with it and we're going to say there's a lot more where this came from and if we'll honor Him, He told us, I will open the windows of heaven. I think you need to hear that again. Are you looking at it, Malachi 3? Let me read that to you from another translation. Can you take another translation? Yes. Mm-hmm. Glory to God. The NET, the New English says, bring your, the entire tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my temple. Test me in this matter, says the Lord who rules over all to see. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until there is no room for it all. Do you believe he's able to do this to cause clothes and things to come to you until you hang out any more room in your closet? You ain't got any more room in, in, the, in the garage. You ain't got any more room in the pantry. You ain't got any more room. Come on now, do you believe that soon and very soon you could throw up your hands and you could say, Malachi 3 has come to pass in my life. I'm living in Malachi 3. I don't know where I'm going to put this. Woo. Then I will stop the plague from ruining your crops 
and the vine will not lose its fruit before harvest is the Lord who rules over all and all nations will call you happy for you indeed will live in a delightful land says the Lord who rules over all. Stand on your